Let us rise. Grace, mercy, and especially God's peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, the basis for our meditation today is taken from the Gospel text. Um, and I want to read for your hearing again, especially the first part, and please pay attention to some stuff. Jesus said there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sore, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Here ends the text. You may be seated. When I was in eighth grade, we sang a song, and Pam said, Well, put it on the screen. And I said, No. But it was um, poor man Lazarus, sick and disabled, and the refrain was, dip your finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I fermented in the flame. And so the title of this message is Cool My Tongue, and as we begin, first of all, we, we all know the name Lazarus. There's a couple people named Lazarus in the Bible. This is not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. Lazarus was a fairly common name. And it was, but it, Lazarus is actually the, the Romanization, the Greekification, if that's a word, of the Hebrew name Eleazar. Eleazar literally means, my God has helped. And so as Jesus begins to tell this, this tale, we need to first of all make a clarification. A lot of times people think this is a parable, but it's not a parable. It has none of the marks of a parable. It doesn't use the word, well, this is like a simile. It doesn't use the word, this once happened. It gives, and it gives a specific name of a person. You see, in the parables, none of that happens. And so here we get to see, we get to see a clear vision of heaven and hell. There's only a few times in scriptures, one in Isaiah 6, where, where Isaiah sees the throne room of heaven and, and the angels flying and the... the, the majesty of the heavens and, and just almost like smoke billowing out of it, the clouds. And it's where we get a lot of our thinks of angels flying in clouds in heaven. And then we get this image of heaven, which is a little different. And so the question becomes is, what does our vision of heaven look like? This is kind of important for us to frame in our mind. You know, we also hear the, in the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic literature, a larger than life size, size of story that heaven has its streets paved with gold. And it has, the city is, is more magnificent than anything we can imagine. And so I think when John came back and had to explain heaven in earthly terms, he said, how can I explain that? How many of you have ever eaten a rattlesnake in your life? What does it taste like? It tastes like rattlesnake. It tastes like rattlesnake. See, that's right. Everybody says it tastes like chicken, but you really can't explain the taste because it tastes like rattlesnake. And so people try to make it similar to something that they understand. And so when John comes back from his vision of heaven, I think when he explains the gates are each made out of a single gem that is gigantic, I think he's trying to explain that it's beyond anything we could imagine, the opulence, the wonder. 
But here we get a different picture of that. We see the rich man goes to hell and Lazarus goes to heaven. And the rich people, the, the, not the rich people, but the people in hell can see heaven. They can see what they have missed, if you will. They're tormented in the flames and they recognize that which they fell short of, which they did not achieve. We're not told that Lazarus can see hell because truly it wouldn't be heaven for those who are in heaven, if they could look in and see their loved ones, see their friends, see the people they knew in torment. Now, Father Abraham, who is God in this, in this story, Father Abraham can look and he can see both. And he tells a very, very poignant message. That there's a chasm fixed between heaven and hell. That the people in heaven who would love to go and help the people in hell because that's their nature, they're loving, they're kind, they can't go. Because that's not their place. And the people who live in Hades and hell, they can't make it to heaven. Because again, they made their choices. They, made their, they, they chose who to follow and who to ignore. So what our, our vision of heaven and hell may be different than anything we've read in the scriptures. And that's okay because it's going to be different than I think any of us can imagine. It's going to be far grander and far greater than we can understand. And so we can understand that there are misconceptions about heaven. Some of the misconceptions you can think of is, oh, it's a white fluffy clouds and all that. <coughs> you know, that, that heaven is just amazing and that's <coughs> true. But it's kind of like when we plan to go on a trip. A trip to a place we've never been before and we imagine what it's going to be like and, and we, we build it up. I mean, if you've, before you ever went to Disneyland, what did you think it was going to be like? You know? And for, for those of us who are young, it's still a wonderful experience. See, I'm a little ahead of myself here. And so in this story, if we remember where Jesus is talking in Luke 16, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there. And this story twists everything around that they believe to be true. You see, the main point of this story is that rich people can go to heaven. Don't think that the story says that rich people can. Rich people can go to heaven. It was not the fact that the rich man was rich that caused his demise. The rich man's motives and the rich man's realizations are realized and his sinfulness is actually himself. You see, he wants what he wants on his terms. When he appeals to, to Father Abraham, Lord, send Lazarus because, you know what? I wouldn't ask you, Father Abraham, but this is Lazarus. This guy begged at my gate every day. Just please send him with some water to, 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 to pull, pull my tongue. Father Abraham says no. And then he says, well, but instead send Lazarus to my father's house because I have five brothers there and I don't want them to be with, the, with, with them, he, with me, with them with me here in hell. And Father Abraham says, I've given them Moses and the prophets. They have the same books you have. They have the same Bible that you have. And that will be enough for them. And, and the man's arrogance shows in his argument. He's arguing with God and saying, no, God, they won't believe. God, I know what you've done. That's not enough. Send Lazarus. And then in a precursor, in a foretelling of Jesus' resurrection, he says, no, even if someone rises from the dead, they won't believe. Jesus rose from the dead, and the world still fails to believe. The man's sinfulness is evidenced by his cool my tongue and telling God what to do. I've been guilty of this. I know all of us have. Been guilty of telling God what to do. And I mean, we, we couch it much more nicely. We make our plans and we say, God, I know you might be busy, so here's my plan of how this could work. <laughs> it always seems to circle about what's best for me in those plans. What soothes my heart, what benefits me. 
And I think God looks at those and says, these are really cute. These have never worked, but they're really cute. Thank you. But we're going to get the orange pair of honey. How can we be Lazarus's? As I said, it's interesting. Lazarus's name means God has helped. God has been my help. Eleazar. When Jesus stood at the other Lazarus's tomb and says, God has been my help, come forth. When the rich man looks at heaven and sees, God has been my help, gathered unto heaven and then recognizes that his godly own sinfulness, his own self-interest, his own focus on himself, and not his trust and reliance on God, was what wound him up where he what wound him to be where he was. So the question becomes is how can we be gathered unto God? It's actually very simple. We trust in God no matter what our circumstances. The rich man's complaint is that he's in torment. And Lazarus, we never heard crying out. He just begged for food. The rich man passed him by every day and, and didn't do a thing. Stories like this in the scriptures convict me. Think of all the people we drive by on the side of the streets every day who are looking for a handout. What is our attitude towards that? What is our heart towards that? I'm sure that not all of them are as needful as Lazarus, but, but does, do we harden our heart to the need around us? We live in a community where many people do not know God. Imagine how terrible it will be for them when we make it to heaven, because we believe in Christ, when we make it to heaven, and they look up from hell and say, why didn't they help us? Why didn't they reach out to us? Why didn't we listen? The task of the church is not to save ourselves, but it's to save others. The goal of the church is not just to make it to heaven ourselves, but to, make, to bring along everyone we need. To bring along those who are in need, to bring along those who may think that they don't need heaven at all. So we trust in God. No matter what our circumstances, we, we wonder sometimes, we go, somebody always said that God is, every circumstance you go in is God preparing you for, for a test later on. And I've often said, if this, is the t if this is a preparation, I don't want to see the test. But just as in school, we took many tests. I think every, every bad circumstance, every, every frustration we have is a test to see where will we turn. Will we turn to ourselves? Will we turn to the world? Or will we turn to God? God is the one who never fails. God is the one who has our eternal, our eternal salvation in his very heart. He loves us so much he would send his son to die for us. And so we need to trust that God knows what is best for us. Even though there are times we will say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because I just don't get it, God. But I'm not going to not deny you. I'm not going to say you don't know what is going on. So I'm going to ask for wisdom that I may know. And know that sometimes I may not learn It's always interesting when we gather together as a family around the table, especially as, as I'm thinking of myself and my brother and my sisters when we would go to see my parents, and we would tell tales from when we were growing up, the things my parents never knew we did. <laughs> I am so thankful I grew up in a time when everybody didn't carry around a phone and a video camera with them. <laughs> this poor generation is in for just a terrible time. But God had a plan. Our parents didn't know everything we did, but, but they still loved us. God knows everything we do, do, and he still loves us. God knows all that is in our hearts. He knows where our heart lies. 
And so we need to make sure that our heart remains tender. By trusting in Him. By not hardening our hearts to a, a group of people, to a people we drive by on the street, people because they're a different race, creed. We, we, we love everyone. We're concerned about their salvation. But we also recognize that it's our task to share the gospel. You see, we need to let God's love flow through us, show through us, that all may be reached. So as we go forth this day, let us remember that, that it, when we face trials and tribulations, we're like Lazarus at the gate. We never hear of Lazarus questioning God's will. Why am I a beggar? Why are these dogs looking at my sores? His name literally means my God has helped. People probably even made fun of him for his name as he was growing up. If you're a beggar and your name means my God helped, help yourself. And don't envy those that are rich simply because of their wealth, because their hearts may be far from God. The rich people who can go to heaven, that's not, a, that's not what we're saying. But they need to trust in the same God that we trust in. That everyone trusts in. From the beggar to the king, let us trust in the God who died for us, who rose for us, and who tells us of his love and mercy. As we go forth this day, let us rejoice that we know the truth, and let us share the love that we have seen in Christ with all we need. May God be with you this day and each day. Amen. Let us rise.